I never seen such desolation. You just, I think we drove for a mile and there wasn't a building hardly standing. Nobody knew what was going on. They called the situation fluid, but fluid means that nobody knew anything. It was different. If I had done something else, I don't know what it would have done. We're talking today with Larry Morris of Grand Rapids, Michigan, and the interviewer is James Smither of the Grand Valley State University Veterans History Project. Okay, now Larry, can you start us off with some background on yourself? Oh, I was born in Grand Rapids here on January 7th, 1945, and um, lived here most of my, my life. And, and uh, What did your family do for a living when you were growing up? Oh, you know, my dad first had a, a pump room. We, were, uh, we had the gas station job for a while, pump repair business, and he worked for Lear for a while, and then uh, mostly Bissell, carpet sweeper, uh, where he retired from. All right, and what kind of sort of education and stuff did you have before you went into the service? Well, I, with high school diploma, then I served an apprenticeship, which lasted 8,000 hours or about four years. And this uh, started out as a high school co-op thing, and they said, you want to be an apprentice? And this it turned me into a college student, more or less, gave me a 2S deferment. And, and till, so I, when I was drafted at age 24, most of my friends have gone and come back, and now oh, it was my turn. Right. Now, what was the apprenticeship in? Machinist. OK. Yeah. And, and where were you doing that? Well, um, the Alexander Dodds company where he started out and then another Rose Patch label bought this company called Veneer Machine Company. And um, they did everything more or less and stuff. And we went into tape-o-matic or early C and type machines, computer machines that they had those in the early days. But then uh, I was drafted in February of 1969 with, this was the Nixon talked about after Tad of pulling people out, but just the opposite was happening. When I was inducted into the service at Fort Knox, it was in a sports stadium. The colonel on the stage says, normally I'm in a room with 30 people where I'll be able to shake their hands, but this time it's not possible. He says, this time we exceed all of Fort Knox records by have 1,640 some people being inducted into the military here. He says this is happening elsewhere. So the year 1969 and 70 was the escalation or the biggest amount of populace of people. Yeah. The, the largest American force I think recorded in Vietnam was in the spring of 69. Yeah. It does go down after that, but that's it. It's right. a peak there. After 70, it was de-escalation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. Okay. Now, um, did you have to, when they drafted you at age 24, did you have to go in for physical first, or had you done that years earlier? Well, um, they you know, stood on the corner by the, what, the art museum of the old post office, and they took you down to Detroit, and mm -hmm. then you got a, a physical there. And from there, you were loaded onto a, a bus or an airplane, I think, and flown down to Fort Knox. Right. Or, now, when you did the physical, were the, was there anybody there trying to scam the system or get out of it that you noticed? Well, there were people there that you could see easily that should not have been taken. One, one particular person that was in the room, and they used to get back in line, and you gasp at the person. It's been a horrendous car accident. Some medical operation. He had huge stitches. His, his body looked like a baseball, literally, and from one end to the other. A that many stitch. If he goes, everybody. And uh, unfortunately, they were taking people that they would have never have, have taken. We had a, a couple of those right in basic training that were had rickets, or they just would not function. We those people carried the slow sign. <laughs> their neck and front and back. <laughs> All right. Describe your basic training experience a little bit. Uh, what kind of reception do you get when you arrive at Fort Knox? Well, this is <clears throat> rounding up a bunch of people like a cattle and then saying 56 of you start living together. <laughs> Let's see what happens. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> well, uh, <clears throat> we um, 
we had the basic training of technical schools and stuff, but only a half a day we're going to Vietnam. So the other half of the day we're getting full combat training out there on the rifle range and stuff. So um, we were using up all the ammunition for the M14 and the M M16 was new and they had them in Vietnam and the official changeover date came uh, about, oh, uh, maybe June of 69 or something like that where I, um, <coughs> yeah, June, right, pretty soon June, <coughs> I had um, an M14 in Vietnam for a while, which looked nice, but I didn't get to use, and I got a six, M16, which I did get to use, but in ways you wouldn't think of, uh, not exactly shooting at people, right. but near right. them. But when you were at Fort Knox, you were still just training with the M14? Oh, uh, yeah, uh, um, Fort Leonard Wood, then we were introduced to the M16, but we could only fire one clip. With the M14, they were handing you 16 clips at a time, and you were going out there firing over right. a thousand many bullets, which would knock you cuckoo more or less. Uh, yeah, they were using up that stuff. But, right. uh, okay. Now, uh, you were older than most of the guys you were training alongside. How does that shape your experience in basic training? Well, I, I was older than a captain, or older than a lieutenant by two years. And uh, the enlisted people, the, of course, the people that are going to be in the Army for 20 years, they, they were older and mm -hmm. stuff. But um, <coughs> just uh, <coughs> most of these people kind of wonder who you are and are giving you the mental breakdown test of, of something, trying to s figure out if you're smarter than they are, it's what they're afraid of or something. Um, yeah, but I, uh, being, tw I turned 25. I was, when I left in October, I was close to 26. Your mind is more developed. You're more resourceful at doing things and getting things done without exactly going through the military channels to get things done. It, it's just uh, who you actually know. And stuff when people uh, ask somebody to do a few favors for them and things, fix the doors on their trucks, and you say, Hey, you know, we could use a maintenance tent. He says, Well, that artillery company next door is moving out in about a couple of weeks. Go over and ask them, you know. So I showed up and says, Gonna use that thing? So I haven't used it yet. You wanna take it? So. Well, how much of that kind of thing did you get to learn or put in practice while you were still training? Well, uh, right away from the beginning uh, in the training where I was. Oh, was I, I, I want you to take, tell us more about your training. Let's try to oh, do your story in order here. Well, the, my, my training was all civilian, where um, the military's training is at Aberdeen Proving Grounds, and they have sort of their way of teaching those guys. But now, I just want to follow your story. Okay. Well, uh, so I was civilian, civilian trained, so uh, uh, anything they handed me was elementary, is the way I called it. <laughs> I could do anything. This is what bothered other people. Uh, it's because they're cutting threads and stuff on the lathe and stuff. Some of these lifers would engage to feed, their jaw would drop, and they would just follow. And, oh, and things running itself, amazing. You know? okay. uh, Okay. That, that's still kind of getting a little bit ahead of yourself in the story. I mean, I'm trying to sort of keep things sort of in order. Okay. We've gotten you as far as Fort Knox. Now, you had mentioned something about metal a stress test or something like that, or what they were, were they trying to figure out how hard you were to break, or well, just uh, no, or? just the fact that uh, uh, I was talking about once uh, my, my cousin showed up, the colonel, um, they got rid of me, sent me down as an advance party to Fan Thiet. Okay. Was but, okay, but you're still talking about Vietnam. I, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to run this interview here so that somebody watching this can understand your story and follow it in some kind well, of order. Well, what it was, yeah, what I was getting to was this, uh, I only a, a month or two I began to do super well, know a lot of people, but my cousin, the colonel, came down for a photo op. Shortly after that, I was on the top of the list of volunteers to go down to Fantheat when they hadn't asked anybody yet. I'm getting this information from Specialist Harris, the company clerk, 
was in there. He says, they've had a few meetings with people. You weren't in on it, but you're, you're going. So he said, those lifers have been going nuts for the last three days and nights down in that junkyard putting this machine shop together. They had to take the motor out of a roller, put it up on the gooseneck. So a day or two later, they says, there it is, get in it. We had only our basic duffel bag and stuff that you have, you know, gas mask and a few things. That can't, you know. We throw it in there and uh, we give us about 35 pieces of old equipment. We go down and get loaded onto an LST in the train along with a bunch of other people. We ride down to Fantheat. We get unloaded down there and uh, we go up to the orderly room and say, oh, we've been expecting you. Where can we park? Well, down there. So we, we get parked there, but this move was super hasty. They didn't send us any beds, army cots, pillows, or nothing. We lived in this machine shop van, 11 of us, under it, on it, uh, in it, for about a month until finally Major Moot came down looking for us. He's been wandering around out there. <laughs> hey, well, over here, <laughs> uh, we could use like a tent like everybody else has, uh, some beds. <gasps> you know, oh, he got us a tent, and then part of C Company began to come down. <clears throat> the rest of everybody was up near Ben Batui, building Highway 21. The uh, company commander, the captain, was in Ninha, which was about 45 miles north of Natrang. Natrang was close to Cameron, where we could get parts to repair. So they brought all the blown up and used equipment down to Natrang, to this third shop maintenance place, to get parts replaced and sent back up. And this was run by Sergeant Patton and a few people, and, and uh, life was good in the train. But uh, they were told to go down to Fantiet several times, and when uh, I come along, we were the advance party. And then from there, we were to go out to a place called Whiskey Mountain, which the Vietnamese already called Nui Top Dome, they had a name for it, but it was Task Force Whiskey. And, uh, the purpose of this is to start a bench quarry, a rock quarry, and put up an asphalt plant. That's where we're going to work on. We're widening and improving Highway 1, which ran all the way from Hanoi to Saigon. The French had built this road, but after War of Independence with the Viet Minh, Viet Cong, this road was completely gone. And in my opinion, this is how the U.S. got their way into Vietnam by saying, Your Majesty, we can fix the roads, fixes the economy, let us in. We were only there to watch Chairman Mao up there in China. He remembers us from the olden days. And uh, now we're next door. And, and uh, so Vietnam was, was called the Great War of Attrition, because by 1969 and stuff, we had used up the first string, the second string, and now we're into the third string. And the same thing, unfortunately for us, was with the, the uh, people in charge, these older lieutenant colonels. Who <laughs> All right. Uh, no, I'm to make this work kind of well, I mean, we have to have some kind of work. Now, what unit were you with when you were doing this? Oh, the, the, the 864th Engineers, A Company, attached to Headquarters Company, were sent down there as an right. advanced party. Okay. Now, did you actually train as an engineer? Well, uh, as a rock crusher, you know, and quarry machine operator at Fort Leonard Wood. Right. And, uh, yeah, the, uh, well, I, I could... Uh, I could spell the abbreviation of Corps of Engineers. They, when you get drafted in Fort Knox, the first thing they fill out pages of, where would you like to be assigned? Why, well, I said, hmm, hmm, how about aboard the Haines in Grand Haven, Michigan? <laughs> and uh, we used to look at the smokestack and see the abbreviation C-O-R-P-S, Engineers. I could spell it. <laughs> so somebody down there as they're going through paperwork, and, <clears throat> I didn't even know this. It went into the engineer pile, which 
The engineers aren't represented too much when you see the Vietnam movie, but uh, I ask people when they were watching um, Rambo or somebody, uh, uh, says, who built that fort, Rambo? Is it who? Combat engineers came out and cleared off the ground a little bit. Engineers' construction came along, made it a little better or something, and then they built this thing. Well, the local natives are upset about urban renewal. <laughs> <laughs> we begin to have a little static, but um, engineers build these complexes and go on to other places, and they build the roads and the infrastructure, and um, so there were a lot of engineers. And uh, we're the building, they're all working on Highway 1 in various places. They all could be at one stop, but eventually they'd link up. And uh, in the early days, they were the CIA people got in there and cut a deal to let us in the country, and they were building the Vietnamese the freeway out of concrete. <laughs> it was about an eighth of a mile a day, uh, which was killing all these 18-year-old kids of heat stroke and stuff. It just was way too slow. So in 1969, the Army officially switched over to asphalt, which is a much faster process of paving the roads. So, um, that's what we were doing is widening and improving Highway 1. All right. Now, uh, to go back again, uh, so you're, you train initially with, with the rock crushers and, and so forth. When did, you f when did they actually send you to Vietnam? Oh, July 22nd, 69. All right. And tell us about the, the, the trip over and getting to Vietnam. Well, you, you ride in a civilian-looking airline, which is not civilian, it's Air America, they just don't tell you, um, and uh, in the 707, and you know, get in, land in San Francisco airport, and you go over to the Oakland, the o the Oakland, there's this processing place, they loaded us on the airplane, and we flew to Hawaii, got some gas, and uh, took off again, and we're up there for a few hours, and we're quite a ways, and the pilot says, ah, oh, you know, I think the oil pressure in that motor is a little left, and that left one over there. We're going to have to stop in Guam. Oh, oh boy, I'm 24. Oh, don't, don't play with the microphone. Yeah. The rest of these people are younger, and, ah, we had World War II, we had to take this place and stuff. Where is it, you know? And I look out the window, and... Huh, it's small, but we get close and land, and you land in, the, the, because it's windswept in like freeway canyons and stuff, uh, shelters as airplane lands, we pulled up at the Aguna Airport. And uh, the pilot said, well, I'm getting off and uh, be back in a half an hour. Uh, anybody, if you want, you can get off and walk around the tarmac in the parking lot here at the airport. And uh, out of 222 people on that airplane, I'm the only one who got off, <laughs> walked around, uh, was tempted to jump in the bushes and run away, but it wasn't a good idea. Got back on the airplane and then. Then we flew along for a while until we came to this tremendous monsoon rainstorm in the middle of the night, which was bending the wings on the airplane, and our stewardess were beginning to vomit. First one, two, and three of them, and they all just sat down, and this airplane is bouncing. And the, figure out how these engines keep running with all this water and stuff, but we did come in and Tan Sanud Air Force, you know, the, the holding center, which we got, they tried to get incoming planes with brand new people in them, so we were getting mortared as the airplane is coming in on the runway. They were off to the right by about 100 yards or so, but from there we went to a metal shelter with all the rain and from from there, you go to the first processing place where they remember your line number, your roster number, and you may be there with a 
a few people you know, but after four days, you're the only one. And so there's, it's more or less the beginning of your experience of Vietnam of being totally alone on the other side of the earth, mm -hmm. starting from square one, of what to do and how to learn this. And uh, mostly what you found out is you had to learn this from somebody else. Either they liked you or they didn't like you. If they liked you, they kind of showed you the way around. Every noise and sound, what's that? You know, <laughs> and, oh, don't worry about that, so I'll go around. Oh, outgoing, incoming, difference. <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, and so that's the way people more or less got along. Other people, if they were kind of eccentrics or oddballs, people just left them alone, you know, and stuff. Or <clears throat> they got sent away or put with somebody away from other people and certain things. All right. Now, how long did you stay in the Saigon area before they assigned you someplace? Oh, well, I, I only lasted four days <laughs> down there. That's why I said the other people, a few people I was in basic training with were there. They're gone. Then from there, we're sent down to Cameron Bay. And this is the place where they're actually going to figure out where you're going to go for your first assignment. So the, about seven, eight days down there or so until finally they tell you the, the trucks come and get over there and you're headed down to your first permanent assignment, which was the Trang. And uh, I got along pretty well with a lot of people and stuff like that, and it didn't last more than two and a half months in the Trang. And then we were sent down as an advance party to secure place at Fan Thiet. And um, you see, I think you were talking before we went on, on camera a little bit about uh, arriving actually at, at Natrang in, in, in the first place. But you were, you had to wait a long time before you got the ride and then... Oh, no, no. Or was, or was that later? When you're sleeping on the truck and the rest of that story? Oh, yeah, that was down at Fan okay, that's, that's, that's they, like they oh, okay. got, We All loaded right. on to put into this old machine shop, man, that came out of the junkyard, which meant that it was DX in military terms. It didn't exist. Mm -hmm. I didn't have to pull what they call motor stables on all vehicles and stuff. Before they get in it, they had to fill out a checklist and things. Um, the other people in my town always had to do this in the morning. I just sat there and they looked at me, who are you? And Well, uh, it's there, but it's not there. <laughs> so. Okay. All right. So go back then to Natrang a little bit. Uh, what, what unit were you initially assigned to in Natrang? Well, uh, um, a, a company. Okay, so 8364th Engineers. Okay. But the A company was also had an office section of called headquarters, an mm -hmm. extension from uh, the captain up in Ninha. Mm -hmm. So this was ran personnel, and this was like shipping and more or less process, the, right. handling the material coming in to go up to Ban Batui. So uh, um, it's a Ban Batui was right where Highway 21 started, I mean, up straight up and then over. Now, what was your actual assignment then with, with A Company while you were in the train? Well, a uh, um, machinist okay. in, in the machine shop there in the, in the maintenance building. And uh, yeah, they had just two lathes in there and two people, uh, Larry Pelton, a sort of Texas person, and. Me, everybody else was out in the warm area. He had an air conditioner on this thing to keep the stuff from rusting. So the people were kind of wondering how I, I got this job right away, you know, easier than they're out there. And uh, But I, I asked about this machine shop. It didn't have too much stuff, and it didn't have a, a Bridgeport milling machine. When I began to ask about who's got one, they said, well, the Air Force has got one. But the Air Force is also intelligence and people in the train were having a pretty good time and stuff and the, the army's version the FBI is the CID the mm -hmm. central intel <laughs> and uh, so they didn't want you asking any questions or going near them and shortly after that I was put on the top of the list as volunteers to go down to Fantheat and establish the 864th which 
During about nine or ten months' time, most of the people all came down from the west of C Company, um, B Company, and D Company came down from Ban Batui and all ended up at Van Thiet in the end, and from there they they went home. But uh, when I, when I we got out there, there was nothing out in the mountain. And after about nine or ten months, the entire company and everybody was down there. This was was headquarters, and then. Um, when they show the the end of Vietnam, they had some red arrows pointed at various places that the Viet Cong attacked, <laughs> and uh, one of them was Van Thiet. And uh, so the experience, I spent 11 and a half months at, at Van Thiet, between landing zone Betty and the mountain. We, we, the machine shop van was moved out there and back so many times they would mess up my pay, I would go to the mountain, and um, I'd be on the LZ. No, that's not, it sounds bad, because this pay officer is gonna, comes out there and he has a, an assistant, and they had an accordion file, and they would look through, and if your name was there, they'd pull out this thing, three copies, a white sheet for you, two yellow copies, one for a, a, a building uh, in uh, two buildings in Washington D.C. in case it burns down, and uh, then they would pay you in military payment certificate money, not, uh, not American greenbacks. This looked like Monopoly money and pictures of battleships, the tanks, and stuff like that. But they can't have you not having any money. So if you you're not in that file, then they were out at the mountain when you were here, so your money went back to the train. This pay officer reaches in and pulls out a form and says, take this to your company clerk. This is instant travel orders to go back to the train to get your money. You're no longer working. He says, he fills this thing out. He says, go down to the airport and wait for the next airplane. And um, so now you get to fly from Fanthiet down to Cameron Bay. <coughs> from there, I'm going to have to hitchhike on a convoy or go over to air con traffic control tower and see if I can get a ride in a helicopter, get myself into the train, and go down and find finance. Just a big building, you know, like a bank, and really like an almost a Donald Duck movie. There's this iron cage window, but behind her is money stacked up to the ceiling. <laughs> behind you. <coughs> My name is Morris. Oh yes, right here. They hand you your money, and now you got paid, and you're in this big town. Should you go back right away? Well, now you might have to spend an extra day or two here and stuff. See some of your friends who were helpful and when you had to leave this place, the Trang, now we go visit them for a while and <clears throat> then fly back. But um, this happened a few times where I was able to uh, film the Trang with a movie camera I bought and take mm -hmm. some pictures of the thing for people back home who tried to make my movie look kind of like a travel log rather than show <clears throat> what was really going on. In the daytime, things look pretty nice around here, but when it gets dark, it's a different story. <clears throat> the war in the South was the war at night. And uh, you could, <clears throat> on this LZ where I was, I <clears throat> had friends that ran the LSNA supply company, and they lived right over on the countryside, and we were parked our stuff over on the ocean side, but this right on the beach, up on, on the plateau. And uh, where their hooch was, we had a front row seat on the war. We could see Firebase Sandy, Firebase Sherry, and Firebase Blaze. And these places would get attacked at night where they would turn on the dusters. So every fifth one's a tracer, and they'd be three layers high. And the dusters like mount multiple 50 caliber machine guns? 40 millimeter ACAC 40 mil gun, okay. put on like a tank body. Yep. This yep. is from World War II. We drop in 10 brown, boom, 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 boom. <laughs> right. 
bullets the size of size D flashlight batteries. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, all the trees and stuff are shot right off to the roots and stuff for well, half a mile around these places. And you can hear gunfights between people, between the AK-47 or something like a typewriter, the cack cack, and the M-16 was a pop pop. And you could hear cack cack cack, pop pop pop, pop pop, cack cack. Gunfights between people only last about 10 seconds. It's over. And stuff with automatic weapons fire and stuff, they fire pretty fast. But this stuff is, you know, if you looked for it, it was out there and stuff. Um, as engineers, we're pretty safe, but the, uh, the LZ had two helicopter companies, two track companies and stuff. And uh, that was their job to work the night shift, <laughs> to go out there, park their vehicles and stuff in different places and have radio contact with starlight scopes. And they're just watching what's going on out there and control the night, more or less. Okay. Uh, now, I think you mentioned you when you first got out there to one of these bases, the base got hit right away or with mortars or something? Oh, uh, well, that was my first permanent assignment in, in the Trang. The mm -hmm. truck gets a flat tire. I go through personnel late. Uh, finally, they says, ah, you got a bed upstairs there in, in the barracks. And so that was still light out, but it was getting dark shortly. But I walked around outside, saw what people were doing. They were showing the movie uh, in a tent next door to the, this barracks and stuff. The mess hall was directly across this. And we, the long line of barracks opposed each other end to end, which went for about a quarter of a mile of buildings. Then uh, there was a open little field, but it, <coughs> I did notice one of those igloo things. This was a, a shelter out there. It had like a half a, a culvert, steel culvert with sandbags over it. Yeah, yeah that's one of those. And all right, now we're <coughs> laying in bed, and I always had a problem with you know, frequent urination. So I'm waking up about two thirty in the morning, and I'm putting my boots on. And I have to walk down the steps over to where Colonel Urinal and. Boom, boom, down at the end of the buildings. Hey, you guys, do they put like a tank or park some stuff down the guns at the end? Boom, boom, closer. These mortar rounds are coming right up between the buildings. They just put five of us between us. Pandemonium, people run like crazy out of this barracks naturally. The side opposite the bombs is three deep in the stairwell. We have to go out the end where the stuff is coming. <clears throat> when I went out the door, I was halfway down these barrack steps, and somebody would experience it. Here comes another one, face the wall. And so we looked at the barracks, and <clears throat> this mortar round hit right on the edge of the mess hall, directly across this sidewalk, and then they walked three of them alongside of our building, then they got a direct hit in our combo building, which <coughs> killed two people in their beds, over, injured about a couple more. And this people from the downstairs were running out of it to this shelter I had found. <coughs> a boy <coughs> was running alongside that building when another mortar round hit on the top row of barrels and put a piece of something into his head. He <coughs> ran to this entrance to this barracks thing. There already were people in there. It was a big sergeant standing there at the door or entrance. He said, I've been hit in the head, and he dropped dead. <coughs> now, I come in, plop down, and there's somebody laying there. Not a mark on him, and the big sergeant says, is, is he OK? No, I'm sorry, son. He's dead. Are you sure? 
you know, mm -hmm. this was my first night. I had to actually step over somebody. And uh, then after that, not too much happened until um, well, us as engineers didn't have as many people uh, that were killed and stuff. We were injured, broken legs and stuff. Um, in the early days, um, the IED was an old person. The Viet Cong would come and find a grandma and say, do you want to watch your entire family die? We'll kill them. All you have to do is sit here with these two wires. When a big one comes along, or I give you the signal, because we're going to be watching you. Mm -hmm. Just do here. She sets off a, a, a mine that blows up the truck, and you're somebody. We go over, and this elderly person, you're not going to beat up, arrest, or do anything to. We may put them, tie their hands up behind their back and wait for the local police to come and haul them away. This person would be arrested and maybe put in a, a, some place for a week or two, but they're not a rest home. <laughs> so they let them out, and they're back. We've caught the same person two or three times in the early days. Um, we were early out on the mountain, so there was a few of us and a few of them. The more of us, the more of them in our position, the better landmines and things like this. Our trucks all had sandbags of a couple layers near the front part in the forward shock. And uh, we got some pictures of our 10-ton tractors blown to pieces. The people survived with broken ankles and things like this, earaches and things like this, but the uh, the, the mines were sort of middle size. It didn't kill them, but they were injuries. And uh, then uh, Bentron Province, where I was, had more landmines than all of Vietnam put together. It's the landmine capital. And, uh, we had early mine sweeping metal detectors. Then um, a jeep that had four of these detectors that ran remote control and stuff. And um, we did extensive mine sweeping before we do any construction in the morning and stuff. But in one instance where three of my friends were killed with, and uh, about seven others, there were, um, we got the road done from Fantheat out to Whiskey Mountain and from there to the other side. Now it was open country. And this was more vulnerable, the more attacks and stuff like that. But they, uh, with, with a lot of water in Vietnam, we had to put drainage culverts across the road. You have to dig up one half of the road one day, see if you can get this pipe installed and stuff, cover that up, come back the next day, dig up the other half and put in the other piece of pipe and stuff so you could keep the road open. And, uh, this gives the enemy an opportunity to go there at night and put some mines in place. In this case, uh, they uh, were close to the mountain, about a mile or so out there, and there's a stream, that creek that went through there, and they uh, had it cleared out, but they'd hit a huge rock. And it was around quitting time, and when these guys running a big uh, D9 bulldozer had a claw on the back, they hailed him over and says, look, we can't get this rock on hook. See if you can, can help us out. And he clamped onto it with this bulldozer and pulled for a while, but it was getting uh, close to nighttime to shut down, 6 o'clock. So uh, they couldn't get it. And uh, so the... The next day, or the, that night, the Viet Cong came in and they put a big charge underneath that rock. This was the only place where the minesweeper couldn't quite detect. And uh, so the next day, around 10 o'clock in the morning, 10 30 or so, boom, this huge explosion. And uh, not normal, and then we see these. The Whiskey Mountain was pretty well established. This was May 22nd. And uh, you see two of these more modern ambulances speed down the hill with a three quarter ambulance slowly tagging along behind the thing. 
and we knew something happened, so people ran in that direction. We hopped on a truck and got down to this place close. But um, they, there was a lot of personnel down there. There were. Uh, this was a, 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 a project for near Fantiet City, so they had civilian engineers out there, uh, 73rd engineers. There were a lot of people in the 864th. There were like seven people killed out there. Three were from the 864th. Others were Vietnamese civilians. And uh, but, uh, Johnny Hines went down in there, stuck a shovel into the rock, and was liquefied, mm -hmm. as they call it. Um, other people went blown up, and a, a person I'd met, a medic, uh, Robert Marther, he was, this guy just came into the company. By that time, we had a mess hall. And uh, we were, when you're out there in the mountain, you have your regular job, but at night, you're on guard duty. It's four nights a week, a guard roster. You're in this guard tower from 6 at night till 6 in the morning. You get, on, if you're on guard duty, instead of working a 12-hour day, you get a 10 and a half hour day. You got time to get your stuff, go up to the mess hall, get ready, get into that guard tower, see there at 6 o'clock. And um, in comes these new guys there, and this Robert Marther, I says, uh, this guy well, apparently was a, a class comedian, a clown. He spoke up right away. These other people with him didn't say nothing, but <clears throat> right away, I'm sitting at a table by myself. They get a tray of stuff. They look around at the other few people in there and sit down next to me. By this time, I'm saying, aha, new people. Aha, I'll get to them first before somebody else. <laughs> so I ask him, I says, these blousing rubbers. I says, we're always losing them. I says, well, what do you do? He says, well, I'm an ambulance driver for C Company. I says, well, I says, no, oh, sooner or later, I says, well, you probably don't operate or nothing right away. You're going to you're go for it, and you're going to go back to the LZ, and uh, everybody goes to the PX for something to do down there. And when you check out right by the cash register, these blousing rubbers are hanging on a card right there, buck for two sets of them. Just get me some. Uh, and uh, all right, I gave him a dollar. And, I talked to him once or twice, maybe after that, but then one day I uh, got a, a movie camera, came from Paysex Mail Order. I'm putting the thing together, and uh, something start filming around the corner. Ah, uh, action comes the ambulance, and uh, he holds up the blousey and rubbers. I get a little footage of this guy, and three days later he's killed mm -hmm. at this thing. Yeah. He was uh, he didn't have his flag jacket zipped up. And uh, that's what they tell you, keep that thing together. But he didn't. He was mm -hmm. casual, standing around there the whole while something came through and hit him in the heart. Yeah. So. And actually, and that, uh, I'll just note here for the audience, we have, um, Larry actually saved a lot of that movie footage that he took, and that's actually in a, a, yeah. a, file, a file that we'll be able to add to what we put up in the archives. You'll actually be able to, and that part is there uh, in that, so you've kept that. Yeah, that part there, and that was an incident with three people, and, and mostly after that, but then um, we replaced a couple of colonels. These people were from stateside, and they were given out Article 15s and for minor stuff and things. People were getting mad at them. And, um, and can you explain what Article 15 is? Well, Article 15 is sort of like a traffic ticket, a mm -hmm. fine, and if they feel like it, they can demote you or else just take a certain percentage of your pay away according to how severe whatever your incident happened mm -hmm. to be, you know. And, uh, okay. Uh, so these colonels, they, they're handing a lot of these things out. They're not very Right, popular. and uh, for not, well, it was in the bottom of two quarter, it was hot. In the daytime, it would be 102 or something, you know. And, uh, so everybody was afraid of skin cancer. You had to have a big hat and a shirt. They knew this is the reason why they wanted you to be in full uniform, and especially up around the orderly room. And, you're supposed to salute these people when you don't know who they are. And, and uh, some of them in the early days didn't, uh, weren't very military or well. They didn't introduce themselves to us. The first one we show, well, you only get kind of big and then you need a colonel, so the guy shows up. But he, he didn't even come to a few of our formations, never talked to us. 
start handing out Article 15s, and the people kind of found a way to get rid of him, and they replaced him with another older person. These people were all 50-some years old, and the men in the state side were very comfortable living now. They're out in the most spartan conditions and stuff, and they're actually having a kind of a hissy or crappy themselves. And so uh, after uh, two colonels, finally they got the word and sent a nice young uh, Colonel Engel, a very nice man who came and introduced himself, talked to us and stuff. We got along great after that. The so how do you get rid of a colonel you don't like? Well, um, my machine shop man was located way down in the very corner, so I only get the gossip. I was mm. not directly involved in putting some C4 on the colonel's phone, but somebody read it on him, so that was a death threat. When this happens to these people, they leave the mm -hmm. very next day or the same day, and that one got replaced with one who thought the first one was kind of a wimp, so he was more strict. and. Uh, Three of our biggest boys grabbed him and put him in a box, Connex box, with a gas grenade. And uh, uh, so then the military realized they had a problem down there at the mountain. And so they, they sent him somebody who, who was uh, Colonel Engel, who was a very approachable person. Mm -hmm. He had black hair. You know? okay. <laughs> so he, he dealt young. with you like you were people and. And you right. went along with him. Well, they had been informed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> yeah. uh, well, how well did, uh, how much time did you, did you spend your whole time with the engineer unit, or were you also with an MP company at some point? Oh, or? no, just, just the, uh, the engineers, and, and uh, 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 most of it was 11 and a half months at Van Thiet right. between the mountain and okay. LZ. All right. Uh, uh, now, you were mentioning uh, before we went on camera, you were talking something about uh, the corruption in, in the system there. Uh, in what ways did you see that, or what were you aware well, of? Well, the, the, the war was old history by 1959 or so. It was almost an industry, and the people in larger cities and stuff like this had uh, um, the black market, the the under uh, the things that we could get normally, and here this crude country uh, would pay three to four times as much. Where uh, one of these small motorcycles, we paid maybe three hundred dollars, three twenty-five for a big small one back then. One of the Vietnamese would gladly pay eight hundred and fifty for that thing in American money. When the annual income in the country is about eighty to a hundred dollars. So a lot of people were involved pooling their money to buy one machine, but uh, once they did get one of these small motor scooters, it's not uncommon to see the entire five family of five on this thing with it's a 60 or 90 cc. Um, and uh, they're driving down these roads, dodging rocks the size of watermelons and stuff in the, in the early days out there. So we, the road was completely washed out and gone from these tsunamis and you know typhoons etc where we had to uh, fill in all the holes and stuff and just get the road drivable enough to put gravel on to get out to the mountain mm -hmm. let alone be again to blacktop and we'll come back and you know get that paved so uh, once you got the road paved with uh, asphalt it's harder to hide a landmine in the asphalt but that didn't that didn't stop them. Uh, one day I, I got some pictures. They, I, they got a tremendous tree from some place that pulled across the road with a bunch of piles of dirt. And which one do you want to dig up? It's got the bomb in it. So uh, you have to call uh, all the traffic is stopped and call the bomb disposal people. In this case, it was uh, Arvins and stuff who put a, a few Claymore mines in this pile of dirt and stuff and blew it up two or three times until they think they got it all. And so uh, We were being harassed mainly by the local Viet Cong, which is a, sort of like the same thing as the Ku Klux Klan or something. Uh, in these days, the local chapter and group who were gathered up enough material and they said, it's your night to go out and put the bomb out there and you better do it. And they, you know. <laughs>
<laughs> yeah, and I, I, I asked you about sort of corruption in the black market. I mean, did, did your unit lose things or have things stolen, or could you buy things if you they needed them? They sold things. <laughs> that's more or less what they were selling to the Vietnamese um, between Cameron Bay, which is the main port, and the Trang, we, our trucks would go back and forth. And, some of these people had five regular customers on the way back there that were Vietnamese or paying them in the American money where mm -hmm. uh, one person had enough money to buy a Corvette and stuff. So there were plenty of opportunities that people, this, this war had been going on so long at the time of people when I was just going in there, all my friends had come back when they said, look, this war will never end. It's going to go on forever, and it did last for 15 years. So from early '59 up to 1973, but um, well, the, most of the pullout was after '71. But during the, this time of '69 and '70, people kind of knew it was going to come to an end. So they were making the best of this of, of a bad situation, <laughs> and, and uh, they didn't. If you're from fresh into town and older, they, you, you could be a, a mole or a spy or something, and so they uh, quickly send you off as an advance party to some place far away where you can't see what's happening. <laughs> All right. So in other words, you, you, you start out at, at, at Natrang, but then they move, they get you moved on along some place. Now, where else? Now, were you ever actually a mole? I mean, did you report no, on anybody? No. Uh, I. Uh, uh, other than the, the, the fact that, that see, when I, um, I did really well in the trank, fixing anything they could, but PA&E, Pacific Architects and Engineers, is a company out of California that hires um, uh, civilian people to work uh, uh, for military contractors, people that are high pressure, 300 PSI for these big air compressors for rock drill. The military won't let you touch 300. They won't let you touch super high voltage. They need mm -hmm. certified electricians and, and a few other things like this. And um, so that their company was backed right up to the 864th headquarters of their shop, to the third shop in the Trang. And Mr. Mr. Kim, their foreman, would come over and I uh, rebuilt sewage pumps and stuff. And um, Ray Leach was the name of that guy who or director ran the whole thing, invited me over to his office, says, you know, I heard a lot about you and stuff. I thought you'd just see who you are and stuff. He, he had a nice, his office looked like something out of a Humphrey Bogart movie, metal size with these big windows uh, that opened up, you know, on the top of a building. It was in the roof with the building with a lot of windows and a big desk and things. And uh, so uh, I was between uh, talking to these people, and uh, I changed my MOS myself, so they, they didn't know who I was in the beginning, but these other underlings and lifers, when you're a new person and you excel faster than they did, they get pretty jealous because you're talking to superior people. They haven't got a word in edgewise in six years, and you're having a conversation with them, and especially if you do good work for them. Later on, uh, these PXs are sort of like a, the social point of one of these military bases. And uh, I'd gotten paint for um, uh, oh, uh, it was Captain Boone later on, Major Boone, who uh, needed uh, another aid station. And I, I walked around this LC if things were available. I asked people that are using them. I got him five gallons of white paint and stuff like that. So now when I'm at the PX, um, standing there, and all of a sudden this major walks by and, good afternoon, specialist. There's a little conversation with you and stuff and walks away. And other people standing around. Who's that? Mm -hmm. Why is this Spec 5 talking to a major? Um, and, uh, or, you know, the two of them, Major Moot, who came down to find us. You know, so I, um, I had a, a conversations and, uh, with, with higher up people, the underlings, ones that are sitting around these um, enlisted lifer people are in there who's gossiping about us. We're talking about them. <laughs> and 
they're a suspect, see, of who, who this person is. Why, why does he, what's he here for? And, uh, you know, I, I likened it to the old Danny Kaye movie called The Inspector General, where everybody who's that and kind of clean up their act to look around, uh, see, you know, things are all right, you know, and be nice to them, but let's, let's get rid of them. That was, was Danny Kaye's thing in the movie. They would be good to him for a day or two. He had got free food, free mm -hmm. stay, and pull the job back in another, another place. So, yeah. Um, yeah, it was just the age factor. And when you're 24 and everybody else is 18 or 19, all of my friends who are 19, I have a lot of them, never made it to, to 20, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, so... Um, I just called it just refreshingly. These younger people were more happy and didn't worry how brutally was an old man. Mm -hmm. I was more scared, more paranoid about things, but the people that were more fun were all these younger people, especially when they go over and sit over on the other side to watch the war at night and right. things. And uh, so, uh, yeah, they, they even tried to... Uh, you know, I'd, I'd been there a long time. Uh, uh, I didn't have a short timer's calendar <coughs> out there in the mountain. I missed by getting hit by a few bullets a few times mm -hmm. by a couple of inches or so. Three of them zizzed by my arm and I fell over just like a John Wayne movie in the road, a bunch of more bullets. Ah, um, oh boy, thanks, Grandma, for all the prayers. Right. Um, I'm still here. And, um, yeah, so I said, you know, between me and God, if I make it, but I'm not going to brag about it. Nobody knows when I'm going home except me and the people and personnel. But do you really think they're going to let you leave this place? <laughs> I just... I don't think so. I had about 11 days to go, and my conscience woke me up. This is an important message from your subconscious who owns your body. And to, uh, look out, clean up your act, beware. You know, <laughs> so I did that. And uh, Sergeant Hibbler, who was, I'd been out on the mountain for a long time, and when this Colonel Engel came along, he moved me back to the LZ, and back where it was a lot more people, and uh, gave me a couple of employees, Jim Christopher and Robert Rupio. And um, we lived in tents close to this maintenance third shop area on the beach. Uh, we, uh, we were taken over by a Sergeant Hibbler who replaced this other person in charge. And normally our formations only lasted a couple of minutes. At noontime they counted you to go back to work. But this guy uh, decided he caught a couple of people doing some dumb things and began to lecture us a little bit. But, uh, these lectures began to get longer by a minute, a minute and a half every day, you know. And we were wondering if this guy was running for a senator back home or orator or whatever his deal was. And I said, uh, you know, he's gaining a minute and a half or two minutes a day here. I said, he goes by the 15 minute mark here, you know. Uh, going into the yellow, we're getting close to the red here. To <laughs> uh, and I just, he creeps past, he went up to about 16 in a couple minutes. So I said, all right, I got to do something about this. And uh, my friends over at LS and A's, Michael Smitty or Smith, uh, refueled the helicopters. At lunchtime, everybody came in for lunch, including the helicopters. But after lunch, they would top off the fuel tanks to go back to work out there. And um, so uh, I present my problem to Smith, 
one night and I says, can you help us out? No problem. So the next day, lunchtime, and he's filling up these helicopters. There's usually an attack group. There's two loaches, four cobras, and, and uh, Bill Huey behind there. And he's the captain who's going to run the crowd. And these things show up at the fuel point flying. They hover about a foot above the ground. And he fills up the tank. And as soon as he pulls the hose away, the next one flies in place and he wasn't afraid to f fill these things up you know out there because he would stood up he would you know get clipped and he kind of presented the problem to the first pilot told them the location tents by the ocean formation so no problem he gets on the phone to the rest of them they're gonna have a little fun so this was not their normal flight pattern for leaving this place, believe me. And they came over and just at about 50 or 60 feet at about a mile and a half in the hour, just slowly hovered over, making a lot of noise, drowned in this sergeant out. Two of them, one, two, and the third one was a, a Red Cross one, and this pilot turned that thing right up sideways, giving Hibbler a chessy cat smile, and Hibbler knew he'd been had. And then the other two hovered down, and he had to look out at this group of people in front of him, and which one is it? <laughs> and uh, so uh, he decided he was going to get me arrested for possibly smoking a cigarette <laughs> of the wrong kind and uh, the re remnants and remains of this stuff which I had quite a bit of because we were having a good time out on the mountain there and they moved me back to the LZ suddenly and I had to do something with this stuff which I couldn't exactly throw in the wastebasket or anything around it. So I had it in these Ritz cracker containers are like an old-fashioned sugar container, about eight inches diameter, eight inches tall, and they had a bunch of these on the under axle of this machine shop van. And uh, oh, I'm down there one day, and Morris, you want it in your personal area? Uh -oh. I had already cleaned that up. I would made my foot locker look like basic training, my socks and tin cans and stuff. And everybody else is messy and stuff, but this was clean. But I had this box that was a bomb fuse box. It was larger than a, a foot locker that I got from D Company 19th Engineers when they had moved out. And I had all my camera equipment in this box under my bed with a chain around it because, you know, people would sell this stuff downtown for a few dollars and the camera costs a lot of money so it's locked up and uh, what else you want in your personal area? I get up there and there's Hibbler in comes two lieutenants from the CID behind them are two MPs and they had a Ziploc bag which was new and forceps from the, the medics open that box. <laughs> I dragged it out and opened it and, and were these leather cases and stuff that, you know, a leather embossed it already said cannon. Open them. When I opened them there were these packets of desiccant and sitting up was the white side which Hibbler held up to himself thinking heroin, cocaine, mm -hmm. or something. He laid that one down. Of course, the MPs and lieutenants could see on the other side of the bag was written cannon several times, but Hibbler going through the motion, open that second one, and darn, two times in a row he gets the white stuff. Then the lieutenants looked at me, and they looked at Hibbler, and the lieutenant moved his pinky and the MPs opened the door and they walked out backwards not saying a word there was no arrest nothing happened so they didn't speak now Hibbler hit the roof 
<laughs> he ran down to that machine shop van and says, I want all on, you know, when, and be, before when I was getting pulled away to back the story, I says, look, I'm getting called up to my personal area, Rupio. I says, wait till I get about 75 feet away that I'm being marched away. Everybody's eyes will be focused on me. He says, quickly, run underneath the shop van, grab all those pot cans, <laughs> stick them in the hole, which was up in the ceiling of this machine shop van. It was an air tank for space. But the floor of the machine shop van stepped up about 10 inches of the height of the back. And this was five foot six. Even if I stood up, I'd hit my head in there. Hibbler was six foot three. <laughs> and Rupio had put everything into that hole. Hibbler had come down and searched that entire van for an hour and a half in the heat. He's sweating in there, pulled every, couldn't find nothing. And, uh, just left, so, yeah, and then finally the day comes for me to leave, you know, and most people say I couldn't wait to leave, uh, and all these other feelings. I was, after 14 and a half months, I was indifferent. At that time, I said, well, what's ahead of me, I don't know, and actually just beginning to know this place. Mm -hmm. Now I got to go home. <laughs> How was it that you wound up being there for 14 and a half months? Well, I extended. Okay. The, uh, me and the Army weren't getting along too well at all. In the beginning, mm -hmm. they were being older and that, and these lieutenants and stuff, when you salute them and all this, you know, the, the, these young kids that are 19 and stuff, and running around Fort Leonard Wood, and, ah, you know, they, they go nuts if you don't salute them. Uh, and uh, yeah, so we get to Vietnam, and the th first thing I did was extend. I says, look, and if you extend, this cuts two days off. So if you join the military, it's three years. If you're drafted, it's two years. If you're drafted and extend in Vietnam and take 70 days off or whatever, this is about five months' time that you would have to spend back in the state side or they're not going to make you general. Uh, and, and this was part of Hitler's thing, is I uh, had, early on, uh, with this machine shop, man, I had had a couple large hunks of steel I would brought down from the train that, you know, they when they told us to get in the shop van with our stuff, I said, I need some stock. And there were a couple of six inch bars about eight feet long. I said, look, you guys, cut me off a couple of chunks big enough for what you can carry and throw them in the back of the van for me. So um, I've been carrying these things around for a while, but apparently somebody knew I had them, and Colonel Martin came down one night. This was when I was back on the LZ. He came down with seven Jeep loads of personnel. He climbs up on this machine shop van and had like a jail bay drop down planks to stand on, and, puts his arm around me, <laughs> son, can you help us out? And he showed me this hitch from a 60-ton road packer, three and a half inches in diameter, they broke in half. Because somebody said, then a young man tried to drive the bulldozer off the shoulder of the road and extend this thing in the air for a couple of seconds. And he broke her off, can you help us out? And uh, I looked at them hunks of steel on the floor there, and I said, boy, I got two of them. I messed up one, I got a second chance here. But so I had heard already other people got promoted for various things in Vietnam. You could get promoted because this is a war zone fast if you did something exceptional. In this case, uh, up near Ban Batui, they were hauling new people up there, driving a deuce and a half, and they had to go through the, the pass up there, this notorious place where curve in the road where the Vietnamese could sit on the other side of the rocket and get you as you came around the corner. They had a pretty good shot as you're making the curve, a slow curve on the hillside, just cut out. And uh, Rocket gets fired, these guys, the deuce and a half, didn't have a top on it. So they jumped into the back of this thing, and they're doing about 35 miles an hour on an asphalt road, though it's paid. 
jump, y'all, and they jumped off to the truck. The deuce and a half gets hit by the rocket, blows the front left tire and the radiator and stuff off the thing. But these people have done them five or six somersaults down the road, got skinned up a little bit, but the uh, people that were up in front driving the truck, as soon as the, this, this deuce and a half wasn't traveling by itself, it was a small military convoy with the cadre or lifers people in the jeep right behind this thing. And uh, so uh, as soon as these people stopped tumbling down the road and began to stand up, a big sergeant said, I promote you here now, and you know, turned these people at the spec bars. Now they can't come into our E4 and below club bar, you know, <laughs> and stuff. So you do learn that you can get promoted. So when this hitch come along, I says, ah, oh, boy, more money, spec five. Mm -hmm. So Lindbergh could fly the Atlantic. I stayed awake for like 36 hours, running gassy. People are screaming at me, some of these people <laughs> in the middle of the night were kind of <laughs> spaced out. Shut that thing off. <laughs> I think it's loud there. Come on up here where I am. <laughs> I'm 16 right there, <laughs> come on dudes. So uh, anyways, when I finished this hitch in less than two days time, more or less, you know, but I was sweating and cuckoo when I got it done. I said, now I have to go find me a lieutenant. So I didn't have to go too far and I ran into this lieutenant, which I thought was a pretty nice guy compared to some of these tin horn officers, mm -hmm. Lieutenant Luder later on became a commander and stuff. So, Lieutenant, sir, <laughs> ever talk to the colonel? No. Do you want to talk to him? Yeah. I says, well, remember a couple of days ago, you're all down there with the, the colonel and the hitch. I says, well, I got it done. I says, look, if you had an army requisition, this thing would have taken five months at the most to even get it here, and it's here. I says, take this thing up to the colonel and show it to him up there in the mountain and, and mention something about a promotion and about how, you know, you, you got the thing done. So, uh, uh, Lieutenant Little goes for the idea of being able to, sir, I've got the hitch. The colonel, outstanding! <laughs> uh, yeah, and something about a promotion. Permission granted! <laughs> <laughs> so I became a Spec 5 in about February when I come into the country in July as a slick sleeve. And this, this made people jealous of me. And especially Sergeant Hibbler, they said it would have taken you a long time to make this rank in stateside. And if I did not extend in Vietnam and went back to one of these forts as a Spec 5 with low seniority, they would have taken that away from me. This was their job. Mm -hmm. And Sergeant Hibbler is going to see to it that it happened before because he knew I wasn't going back to Fort Leonard Wood or someplace. I was going home. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, yeah, and then uh, so I, I extended and when I was uh, drafted, I was in with a bunch of just young children and some of these black people, kids right from Detroit ghetto and stuff and me and them didn't get along. I'm 25, 24, they're 18, you know, so they, we had a little friction and stuff, but uh, a guy named Prince more or less, he's the leader of these dudes, they're pretty aggressive. This person wanted to, you know, get in a fight with me, huh? they're just going to stab me into them. And it went in the can one time. We almost come in to pull it on the razor blade and shit, you know. And uh, but I just stared him down and packed off. But now uh, Vietnam was over with, and these guys extended uh, too. So we get down to this holding center to get on the airplane. I, you know, and the uh, first time they, I ran into the center and run right into Prince, mm -hmm. and you know. Right away, uh, we just grabbed each other and said, you're a fine looking young man. <laughs> These people have just changed immensely from children to good looking adult people. I says, you know, and we just hugged each other instantly and stood back and said, you know, we called each other a couple of names, damn it, you know, 
in from Detroit. Yeah. And uh, yeah, then we get on this airplane, but uh, a lot of us, you know, were saying, look, man, we made it so far, but this airplane, we didn't check the oil on it, or how much gas is in the tank, or who's driving it, or how much sleep he had and stuff. And uh, they're a civilian-looking airline, except there was one letter different in the name up there. <laughs> Brand F had a couple extra E's in it or something. This is Air America, you dummy. <laughs> the CIA's airplane. <laughs> and uh, so when we got in this thing, you know, another 707, and the thing lifted off, a few people began to make some whooping noise, but the rest of them all just turned around and cool it, dudes. <laughs> you know, we ain't checked the oil in this thing. And when we see the coast of the USA showing up into the windshield of this thing you know, out the windows, then then people did make a lot of noise and stuff like this. We're finally back, and that was in the Fort Lewis, I think, Seattle, Washington. Yep. And uh, we had to stay there overnight, you know, the same thing, transit barracks and beds with no springs, and the next day they just were just anxious to get out so nobody knew anything about PTS or filing any claims. If you were in the Navy with all the scuttlebutt language that you know, people like this file the first day, you know, we're glad to just get out of there. So the, the problems that you have with just leaving the place are subconscious mm -hmm. for a long time. So you, first of all, you don't realize What's really wrong is you miss all these people that were your immediate military family mm -hmm. are gone. And now you're back in a world that's indifferent. If the people back there don't have a direct hookup with a person in the, in the military, that's somebody that they actually know, then they, they really don't care. It's not in the wars on the other side of the earth. and. Uh, they tried to keep this war as quiet as they could for a long time until during the time I was there was all this protest and stuff. The the day we're getting attacked out there in the LZ was the same thing when the Kent State incident took us the attack on the LZ on May the 5th or something would have been a more front page story than, than something happened at our college and things. So the war was unpopular. and. Uh, um, you know, at Union High School, we had Lieutenant Colonel Keith Houston, U.S. Army, retired, a history teacher, and uh, the colonel was was different. The colonel was, was sexist, of course. <laughs> Stop. <laughs> he come right out with it. And we got a new class of people, and he look around and said, "Who's the prettiest girl in the room?" says, you're going to be the secretary. You're going to sit up next to me, and the people will look at you, will look at me, instead of looking at you all the time. So if you were the best looking girl, you were in for it. You, you couldn't, you weren't, you no, know, didn't mean anything to the colonel. Get over here. <laughs> I'd like to kind of go back in, into Vietnam and have you talk about a couple of other themes. Uh, you mentioned, uh, for instance, you know, we had your own, own supply of marijuana and things. How common was marijuana use in your unit? Oh, this, the, the drugs were rampant. Uh, being a, a Christian and people with good sense in Grand Rapids, so alcohol bad. You know, beer and pot are, are elementary, but there were several other drugs in, in the, uh, Vietnam had what we call the drugstore. They call the chemist. And believe me, this is the chemist. And they sell um, narcotic barbiturates, the thing called the binoctol. This thing was the size of an Alka-Seltzer tablet, had a split in the middle. And this is an, a, 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 a uh, a, 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 you know, it's, it's a, it's a, I mean, it's, it's an opiate, mm -hmm. you know, a, it's a, a barbiturate. This thing is a, like an aspirin, but if you have a, a migraine headache and we take an aspirin, this thing was a, an atomic bomb for your headache. This is, it, it's, it's a, um, you know, a narcotic, and. Um, the people that worked in the orderly room, 
and stuff. All their friends are going to smoke pot and drink beer and have a good time. They got their own personal vehicle, sneaking around and having, you know, getting away from the army. But if you have to work in the office of all these lifer people, you can't do that. So these people were taking these binoculars, so it made them feel like they drank a case of beer. But uh, these were highly addictive. At first, a half of one would do you up for a couple of days, and then a whole one after that, or one, people were up to 11 and a half a and, day. And where were they getting these from? From the pharmacy downtown. Okay, so from the Vietnamese. Right, yeah. and uh, between the binoculars was the narcotic bar pitch, what, then the other one was liquid speed, obesitol. This was a small bottle, four ounces or less or so. It had on the label look like the red and white fishing bobber, only this was a person's head with short arms. And uh, this was for obese, ob you know, but if you... For weight loss, yeah. Right, but people, if they, I never messed with this stuff, but if you took a couple of swigs of this stuff, this was liquid speed. And people uh, out there filling sandbags is between guard duty and filling sandbags is what most people do all their life in the military, keep improving their house. But this fellow said, you know, he gets with this new company and all these boys are running around, they're smiling, they're filling them sandbags, they're moving like crazy, you know, building sandbags. And well, what's with this guy? It's well, it's this stuff right here. <laughs> you know, you know, try it. You know, a couple of swigs of poison. They're out there. So, um, obesity was. We were, and these people were careless. It's like if you drink and drive, uh, you don't know the sheriff to find the evidence. Don't throw your beer cans along the road. Well, these dummies are throwing obesity bottles out the window of their army truck. So they're in the ditches. You know. Occasionally, you might find a joint in the road uh, or something like that that <laughs> fell out of somebody's pocket. But uh, there was that. And then there was a pure opium. Now, these people that ran this supply company and stuff like this, they were into drugs intravenous and stuff. Now, these people, you have to like looking for rattlesnakes, turn over rocks to find them. But. Uh, these people trusted me. It was sickening to watch people shoot up and things, or opium out of the thing, but I did have their confidence. Mm -hmm. I know when I was in there watching them, I could remember a Christian reform minister in religion. God, I says, but wailing to these people isn't going to do anything. Mm -hmm. Just watch. Mm -hmm. So um, there were several drugs, if you wanted them, and things like that, although we we're not into the combat stuff, but people, Marines and stuff, were using heroin. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a painkiller. If you lose a few pence, this is going to knock you off your feet, as they would say. But if you're pickled enough on this stuff, it doesn't bother you as much. You're going to hang on. You've got your senses, yeah. things like that. But, um, it dep you know, it's just your intelligence. Uh, although a lot of people did... Uh, commit suicide over several things. So we had a epidemic of suicides out in the mountain for various reasons among these young people. This was part of the reason why these colonels were getting kicked off the mountain. This was just far too strict, causing these people unnecessary problems. When this happened to enough people, you get a vigilante society that does something about it in the middle of the night. Sometimes it's just one person that took the initiative, but had been talked about enough, <laughs> I think so. Um, and there were no MPs out on the mountain. They were too scared mm -hmm. to come out there. So <laughs> and uh, it, uh, it, it, it depended. There, there were, uh, oh, well, we listened to, well, always curious to what happened later on. See, once, after I left in October, from there on, this is personally the reason why Sergeant Hibbler was after me, because I was safe back on the LZ. Things began to get a lot worse. These helicopter companies on the LZ went home and left them with no helicopter protection. Mm -hmm. So the helicopter companies gave the engineers a couple helicopters. 
These track companies pulled out and gave the engineers, the, we ended up with eight inch more track vehicle howitzers, mm -hmm. uh, quid and quad 50s, um, 40 millimeter, all the stuff that, uh, that most infantry units were having, we had this stuff out trying to build this road past that mountain. Well, it was no man's land and open season for the, the Viet Cong out there. And then later on, we, we wondered where they all came from. But out there, about 10 or 15 miles, was a huge lake and a reservoir and stuff. So they could hang out by there with a lot of water whenever they got in the mood, come on over. So, uh, yeah, things did you know get a lot worse for the engineers till finally they did pull out and uh, turned it over to the Vietnamese. The Vietnamese were moving out there, the military people with their families. And L.C. Betty turned into L.C. Bronson, which the Vietnamese used as an airport for about 10 or 15 years. After that time, the erosion, the place was coming apart, and they knocked all the buildings down and leveled it. And it was off limits until about 205. So now uh, several people have gone back to LZ Betty, just a, with nothing but a little bit left of the, of the runway and stuff, and it is completely eroded away. Or mm -hmm. canyons at least a half a mile and stuff, these erosions. And uh, it rained more when we were in Vietnam is because we were seeding the clouds mm -hmm. <laughs> over there to make it rain to wash out the road for the North Vietnamese. So, um, yeah, I've gotten pictures and stuff of the, these monsoon rainstorms and a couple of one of the cases, one of these huge guard towers that rained so hard to water washed the top, water dirt around the people fell over you know guard tower came down with the people in it you know. how much contact did you have with the vietnamese civilians in your area well we hired them mm -hmm. <laughs> um the the lc was a big place so we that place had a, up to a couple hundred employees we uh, uh we don't make our beds and we don't wash our clothes because we can hire Vietnamese girls to do this, see? And the same thing with KP duty, you can hire Vietnamese to do the KP. So these are hired by people in our tent, a squad leader or somebody going downtown. And then uh, most of this is washing our clothes, but the inner structure of the LZ had garbage collectors that were Vietnamese men, had electricians, we had a, a, a water purification plant, and this was run by a Vietnamese civilian, and um, various other, other people in there. This LZ was, had 10 or 12 of anybody you could think of militarily, plus the Green Berets lived underground outside the place in their compound you couldn't see, but they're out there. So they, there was th this mixture of, of Vietnamese. Now, these civilians were threatened by the Viet Cong to get as much intelligence as they could from what was up there on the LZ and stuff like that. And, uh, and when they would attack us, they would make these people go along with them. The people that worked there in the daytime were right out there with the attack crews and stuff. and. Uh, this one older guy was an electrician. We all liked him and stuff, but we ended up killing him one night. Mm -hmm. uh, he was, you know, and so um, there was this mixture. And then uh, the city of Fantheat, there was no way to get out off the LZ. We had to drive through this. So this was on limits in the daytime, but not at night and things. So we convoy through the town all the way through there. and. Uh, when you'd be on guard duty and stuff like this, you had from six in the morning till noon to uh, you know, where you had to go back to work. So, and you're supposed to go back there and go to sleep or something. But instead of that, I would run down to the point, uh, you know, the driveway where people are lining up to go back to the LC. And anybody need a shotgun? Yeah, somebody to ride in the front seat. So then, so where we would ride back to the LC and and. Uh, if it was somebody you knew with, you might get a ride back, you know, you ride back with them. But if it was somebody you didn't know, you, you just have to, around 10.30, try to think about going back out there because you're supposed to be back there by noon or 1 o'clock at least and they go back to work. So, uh, yeah, and then you 
go in there and, and go to the PX or go find Smith and a few people and <laughs> get some supplies for the rest of the people and go back out to the LZ and things. But on the way back, now it's 10, 30, 11 o'clock, we have to go through several intersections in the city where there are groups of about 20 people standing in a circle and they got six or seven bodies laid out on poncho liners saying, who is this, your brother, uncle, anybody know these people? And uh, they're not wearing nothing, they're naked. They only got on a pair of faded out boxer shorts that are so old that they might at one time had some color, now they're just the color of, of gray mm -hmm. cotton. And, uh, you know, they, you pass about three intersections and stuff like this on the way out. Now these people have been killed out there somewhere in the countryside or in the people at, in their homes at night and all of a sudden they have a gunfight in the backyard and the stuff and they don't dare go out there. They might hear somebody moaning but they don't dare go out and help them. If they go out there, whoever well, shot them, we shoot them. So. But uh, as soon as it gets daylight, they go out there and drag this body out to the edge of the road. And then the national police or somebody will mm -hmm. come along, collect these people, bring them into town, and figure out who they are. And what's the violence? Is this done by the Viet Cong or just by criminal groups? Or Well, this, this is uh, fights between whatever's happening that night, these gunfights that are happening out there. Some of these, we said, they're, it's all the way between disputes between people themselves mm -hmm. and Viet Cong and uh, you know, in, uh, trying to get into this town. Now, what Van Thiet was part of the, what they call the Ho Chi Minh Trail had five or six fingers mm -hmm. that spread out, and they were following this water trail. Now, in Van Thiet's pretty sandy and stuff, so eventually people had to get near this river or this town to get some water or go out to that reservoir someplace. And uh, behind is a place what they call Disneyland, this part of this forest. There, uh, there's a guy who owns Easy Russ's, uh, it's an auto parts motorcycle junkyard off in the panel road there. He drove a tank outside right behind the LZ or Whiskey Mountain and stuff. I, I didn't know that at the time. And he, his tank had a plow on the front and stuff because he was the first one and stuff. He hit a, a an I tank mine with the, killed a couple people in his tank or sticking out the top and stuff. And uh, the tank uh, had a big smile on the plow in the front there where it hit the thing. And uh, a, lot, a lot of people had been to LZ Betty and around the area and stuff right. like that. Yeah. So Now, to go back to the Vietnamese, you mentioned that you had somebody in your unit who could speak some French. Oh, yeah, that was back up in the train, Jerry Campbell, who had three and a half years of high school French. and. Uh, this was during my first only two months. Uh, we would go downtown in the daytime, and, and uh, he was talking to the, these French people in, in French, and they were mostly just talking about daily life and how hard it is to exist mm -hmm. in this economy and how sick they were of the war and stuff. But they, the train had all these American GIs in the thing. This is on the street. You're not popular, but. Once we were, you know, we were in this, this person's house and stuff, I'm in there, and uh, there were pictures on the wall, uh, but all of them were uh, studio. I said, these Oriental people, we don't have any straight on looking pictures. They're all isometric or a, a, a photo, you know, view. And uh, Jerry Campbell's talking to four or five adult people and they're only having a conversation in French. But uh, these Vietnamese don't touch, they don't wave, and, and their dress gestures are, 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 in the, are much different. They live on the other side of the earth, so they're not Caucasian. Uh, but I'm sitting there <coughs> drinking a beer and smoking a cigarette in the corner and stuff, and this uh, people's wife noticed I'm all sitting there alone, so. She comes over to me, and using the French gestures, she puts her hand on my arm and forearm and stood me up. That's Orientals touching you. No, this is French gestures. Mm -hmm. And 
she takes me over to the mantel. This house had the French built it. They have to have a fireplace from Moa's picture or something. It was a fake fireplace with a mantel. And there are two small pictures of their boys, Arvin soldiers. And that's why we're in this house. Mm -hmm. These people have sons that are our age that are in the Arvin, the Vietnamese army, and they haven't heard from them in, in eight months, the other one, 11 months. Um, so there are pictures. Next to the picture is a pack of Salem cigarettes. This is the offering to Buddha. Mm -hmm. And she says to me, these are my two boys. Um, I don't know where they are. We haven't heard from them. She says, I only hope that someplace, somewhere, they are in a place like we are in this room today, having a good time, and sits me back down. That doesn't stay with you. So I have these experiences in the train, see, but people are suspicious of his talking to these people. That's why you get sent down to Fantiet as an advanced party. and. Um, they were, you know, glad to get rid of you, and, 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 and Van Thiet was truly an adventure, <coughs> going out to that mountain, mm -hmm. um, pushing off the overburden, staying out there. You looked at that place and you said, this is as far away from the civilization as I'll ever get. I, I don't want to go out there, but... One should out there, there was, there was no MPs, it was an easier life and stuff, people, more friends, people were more, more relaxed, mm -hmm. no shirt long, we have a pretty good time until a few colonels come along mm -hmm. and stuff. Um, but, uh, oh, yeah, it was my thought about going out there. Uh, yeah, the, the, oh, just the, the freedom of being there and, and coming, coming back, uh, um, oh, I forgot what we were talking about a little bit. Well, I, mean, we were, I, I was just having you fill in some other pieces of the story. But basically, in your large, longer story, I mean, we've gotten you back to the States. and You get discharged right away when you get back? Yeah. And um, at that time, even to begin with, uh, see, my friends have all gone. They've gone back. A friend, Paul Winkler, was on the Coral Sea and stuff, of the aircraft carrier. And I'd been out to San Francisco to see him in 68. And um, so they had an apartment in this building, this house that is, was the last time I saw it on TV was a Guatemalan embassy. But this house that this Michael Anderson and uh, one of Paul's friends, these kids were problem children and they had been sent to a few special schools that were impossible to get kicked out of, but they managed to burn the rooms <laughs> down. And uh, they were living in a house that was twice the size of the Voigt house. This thing had five stories, was built into a very steep hill. In the basement, you could walk in on one side, the other side was a wall. This thing had the most beautiful woodwork I'd ever seen in my life in its hallway as you went to this thing on the sidewalk as an angle, some steps, a flat, more steps, another landing up in the big oval glass door for the coat room, the hallway, about 10 feet deep. From there you looked at this long hallway with this beautiful staircase to the left that went up, turned sideways, went up and turned up onto the second floor. This was a fun family home. It was five stories tall. And so this was rented out into 11 different apartments and stuff. And um, so Paul says, hey, look, man, you're going to San Francisco. Stop off and see Michael Anderson before you go. So I see him in the apartment. He gives me some pot. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and uh, I fly on the airplane. But then uh, when I came back from in Seattle, you know, this Paul was living down there in the same building. He had another apartment. He was selling weeds. <laughs> so uh, um, 
Yeah, I, instead of going straight home, which was nothing, and, and, and uh, so I stayed in, in San Francisco for about a week or so. But to go back way in, in the beginning, see, this, this war was not going very well. If you'd watched it on the TV set in 68 or so, we were killing 300 and some odd people, 200, close to 300 a week are dying over there. So. Um, you know, and and the, I this apprenticeship. See, I, I it ended October first of '68. You know, and I went down to the draft board. You know, I'm registering these guys, mm -hmm. and they says, "Well, how long is it going to take me?" Well, they says, "Well, the way the things are going in the government, it might take them about a month or so to figure out, get your file and stuff like mm -hmm. that, and then." Once that gets processing through there, you got about 45 days, more or less. So, you know, so, and uh, you know, so in the meantime, I entertain myself by talking to the marine recruiter and a few of these other people and stuff, and, and uh, you know, and then getting kind of nowhere. And uh, people had already informed me what the, you know what these people were about and things. So. Yeah, you, you just get drafted, you know, and and go. But did you have a job waiting for you when you came back? Or no, not? you just had done the there apprenticeship. Was, there and was a the economy was done for with Ralph Nader and and, and that era, where uh, the, the joke was the only significant change in a new model car would be on the title. They, they didn't want to. So the dye shops and, and machine shops weren't doing anything. We were in a recession. You couldn't buy a job in the dye shop. These snelling and snelling agencies had dye makers as thick as the New York phone book at applications. And uh, when I went to a rose patch label, I cruise in there and it's pretty quiet. There are no employees. The two department heads are looking at each other, who's going to go next and stuff. So we were on unemployment for the longest time, a year or two until finally through a friend of a friend, got me a job at Ranger Tool and Die at night for a while, which is not the best place. And uh, I'd had my application in all over town. I've been so many places three mm -hmm. times. And, you know, I, I cruised, you know, they call up their personnel, you fill out a form and they keep it in their file. You come back and say, look, dude, I've already been here one time. This is, um, you know, you got your own system, but put a mark on my file, a two or what the hell, you, your mm -hmm. system, there's to note that I have been here for a second time applying. And uh, so it was a rapid die, I'd been there three times. <coughs> and uh, this like almost an incident with Hibbler and stuff, I was out there and working a night shift at Ranger and this night shift boy, when lunchtime came, they were, they jump in the car and thing a fishtail down the road, both of them go down to the bar at Standale and get really drunk and stuff and come back and be lighting your shop rags on fire in your back pocket. <laughs> <coughs> and somebody went into the can and wrote some graffiti about Mr. Rapp, the foreman, and uh, he comes out, sees that, sticks his finger right in my face and blaming me. And I know who did it, but I ain't going to say, you know. Well, that got me really mad. You know, I said, look, you dumbbell, you don't know who you're dealing with. You stick your finger in my face. Yeah, you know. So this darn place, you went to work at 4.15 in the afternoon and got out like 3.45 in the morning. Some crazy hours, you know. And, and, so now I get back to this little house I'm renting and I'm laying on a bed passed out really big time at about 8 o'clock in the morning. The phone is ringing. I can barely hear it. I'm so sleepy. I crawl over to the thing and pick it up. I says, Kay at Rapid Dime, would you like to come down for an interview? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I got hired and left. Rapid I'm a ranger. Oh, you can't do that. <laughs> yes, I can. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you morons. And uh, but this place turned out this is the meanest, cruelest place in the city to work. Believe me, rapid die. And uh, I mean, 
old alcoholic, Jim McGarry. His name was Harold. If you call him that, he hits you. <laughs> and they call him Jim. And uh, yeah, this was, uh, we were in build injection molding, and uh, this dye shop was built by George Leonard, who started out in Detroit and told people he was a dye maker, but he wasn't too good at it. He got fired. He was fired ten times in a row, and at the eleventh time he owned the place. Mm -hmm. And uh, he had built four dye shops in Detroit. And so he started Rapid Dye over in Grand Rapids, the first mold shop and stuff. So they were pioneers in plastic mm -hmm. mold before anybody in Grand Rapids ever built anything that wasn't a mold. And, and uh, yeah, they, this was full of a bunch of you know, characters and things, but uh, you had to work 10 hours a day. If you did, you're out of there. And uh, being a veteran, and either being employed or unemployed, was, you know, and uh, yeah, well, that's what we were talking about at the beginning when they were talking about getting drafted and things. This, this, uh, uh, this war was not going good. So, you know, I, I had a car and a dog and live with my parents. And I go out with a couple of girls on a second date, they're asking you to marry them. And I says, huh, a nice compliment, but do you want to live with your parents? Do you want to live with my parents? Mm -hmm. This isn't their idea of getting married. They don't want television or care about the war. And I'm going to the army. I mean, I don't want to, you know, but I'm going. So. I put this off, and uh, this probably wasn't the, you know, I didn't have any money. And no backing from parents or nothing, so, you know, you just tell them, look, I afford gasoline and dog food for my dog, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> let alone getting married at this time without any great support of family wants to kick in a bunch of money to help you out or something. It's not there, so. Um, you know, when you do come back and stuff like this, it's, it's, you know, you're 20, 20, no, almost 26. You get, get a job, finally, you're 27, 28 and stuff. And, uh, you know, to try to find somebody, a girl hooked up with a married divorce, a bunch of goofy stuff you didn't want to get complicated with. It, it's just, you know, there aren't anybody left. And uh, I had no problem with very young girls and stuff like this, but you know, I'm 10, 11 years older than mm -hmm. them. But out on the mountain, boy, we, we lived on sea rations for four and a half months out there. When I was 25, I weighed what I weighed in the 11th grade when I was in the wrestling team and had to mm -hmm. weigh 137 pounds. A lot of people in the, in the movies, if you look at these people, how thin they are, mm -hmm. is because of the extreme heat and right. living on sea rations or you know no other junk food and, and moving around constantly all the time in the heat so everybody was in really good condition that's what i said most girls would pass out over here at the side. oh these good looking boys especially you know i'm some i'm 20 25 and you know these kids are all growing up where they have their natural body and haven't gained any extra fat yet and so um yeah when you come back and people look at you you're 27 and never been married what's wrong with you they look at you something crazy i said well look dudes you know uh, you know I didn't think it would be a good idea I says you know is it coming back if you got a couple of pieces missing off your body that really isn't fair to your person you married because they never seen you I mean, a couple of weeks got married went over there and come back and you now you're half there or something and this is not you know usually these things don't, don't last too long and it's not a good idea so um that was more or less i really found a few girlfriends but more or less they just Surprise, I got a couple of kids or something and then they were more interested in their welfare and mm -hmm alienating me from them and things so you just end up alone you know more or less at an older age and that's 
tool shop I worked at. I worked there for 34 years, but the 207 in, in bubble between uh, the, all the housing, you know, the hedge market mm -hmm. and things actually stopped these tool shops, which used to work even on Sundays. So mm -hmm. the economy was, so I was, was laid off or permanently at age 62, and I'm supposed to go to age 67. And, didn't have much money or anything planned. And he just says, December 28th of that 207, you're done. Happy New Year, you know? So the unemployment of all 208 and, and uh, you know, for unemployment, you go around to these shops, but you know, who's gonna hire somebody who is this mm -hmm. old and stuff like that? And, and uh, um, so, you know, yeah fill out the forms after a while you have to go visit some of these places mm -hmm. and, you know and you show up and we, one of these places over here on, on the oh. Oh, south of town here and it's a pretty nice looking personnel guy who looked at me and says hey, you know we you know pretty good shape <laughs> we just may hire you mm -hmm. you know he signed the, the thing there and then, uh, you know, finally Social Security, and then and it was that you had a job, which you had to be there all the time, more or less, and these dye shops are highly competitive, and the pressure, the people that are running these things got these people, the dye chasers, the people that are contract and get the job, and they aren't exactly truthful with you. Right. They'll, they'll is, tell you the job needs to be done in four months or, or, when, or, you know, or two months or something. Four months usually. Is, it takes a while to build these molds sometimes, mm -hmm. four or five months. And, but they'll just move the date up a couple months and the person building this and kills himself building this mold to get it done on time. Now, of course, the, you know, our interview here, this is really kind of about your military experience. Yeah, you kind of gotten and, you got pretty uh, well through that. Um, overall, I guess, to look back at it now, um, what do you think you, you took out of that experience? Was there a positive side to it, or did it just mess up your life? Well, the, <coughs> it was just a big vacuum. You come back, you're glad to be employed and stuff, but, you know, uh, in, the, in this tool shop, see, I did sort of the meanest, hardest job there was in there because there, nobody wanted this job, mm -hmm. running a horizontal boring mill, which uh, in the old you know, the television it would say, what's the most dangerous job in the world? It was Icelandic fisherman, or bomb disposal Icelandic mm -hmm. fisherman, number three was milling machine operator, mm -hmm. and that's what I did. <coughs> and. Uh, the horizontal boring mill is a large sideways drill press type machine capable of milling. Nowadays they're completely CNC and the stuff. But the one I ran was manual and this is a big table. Everything you load on this machine is loaded on with a crane, overhead crane. You're not going to put too much on there by hand. And uh, yeah, so you're running the, the boring mill, at least it kept you, you know, you got employment and stuff, mm -hmm. but it was a lot of physical work. If I didn't move, this machine don't move. <laughs> and, uh, right. Stuff and uh, yeah, <coughs> running that thing for until uh, more or less you're getting outmoded by CNCs coming along. And, All right. Uh, and then, sort of, how is that? Is that a byproduct of having been in the service? You were just willing to take the job, even if it was a hard. Well, one? Um, you you got a job, and even even back then, you, you know, between smoking a little pot, you these people didn't care. The, the people in these own these dice shops, you mean nothing to them. If you work there thirty years, they mm -hmm. don't, they could care less. Right. <laughs> and that's the way it was right up to the end. You know, they, you know. Um, so you got a, a pretty good job. It's pretty easy. Anything to hand you and stuff. It just more or less came to where the work ran out. Right. And, and uh, yeah, then you're you're sort of left alone for you know when the money runs out and girlfriends run off and stuff. So now you're alone. And um, 
Well, the only thing I've got really is all these memories. In mm -hmm. my case, I have all, all kinds of slides, color yeah. transparencies of things, and mm -hmm. some of this stuff we converted into uh, DVDs right. and stuff. And then um, the 864th Engineers it has an alumni association. The, the 864th was created in World War II for the build runways for the Air Force, mm -hmm. was split off from the Army. So they've been around, activated and deactivated, and uh, they had so in the last couple of years they had an alumni association which I joined. So mm -hmm. I've. Uh, been to Washington, D.C., and, and to Nashville, where I'm seeing people I haven't seen in 44 years. Right. But I, I went especially because Jim Christopher, people that work right, right with me on the machine shop van, and um, just being older in that uh, Christian doctrine, you're not arrogant. You, know, you got knowledge, share it with people. Mm -hmm. See, now some people, if they had this machine shop van, I've got the secret. Nobody else mm -hmm. can do it. Well, I, uh, I just, you know, I help people out, train uh, Christopher and, and all that stuff, and and uh, got this maintenance tent for these mechanics and stuff. So, um, and, and they pull in a few tricks on him, but people remember yeah. who yeah. I am. Uh, so you've got there. There is kind of a place for you with that group. Well, they uh, they certainly remember. And, and uh, Frenchy, the guy who started the website, see, mm -hmm. I, I bought a computer and uh, punched in LZ Betty, and up pops a website. Mm -hmm. and holy cow, you know! I had all these pictures, so I sent him about 150, and he used a bunch. But he, he right away says these are the best photographs I'd ever gotten from anybody. And I said, well, I'm using Canon FTQL single mm -hmm. lens reflex, and I bought a few lenses, and uh, photography was my hobby over there mm -hmm. out of boredom. And I knew that after studying photography, you're your own worst critic, and you know that candid pictures are the only really good pictures. When you ask people to stop and pose, mm -hmm. they freeze up. So, um, yeah. Uh, he looks at these things and gives me front page billing on the website. When yep. you open it up, this is pictures provided by Larry Morris of the 864th Engineers. Mm -hmm. Shows the searchlight on the top of Whiskey Mountain up there. Uh -huh. And uh, I'd climb this mountain four or five times on Sunday afternoons and stuff. You know, people were, they just didn't want to do anything. I said, look. Let's climb the darn thing. I said, Sue Edmund Hillary, Mount Everest, all this stuff. You know? So you climb this <laughs> mountain. Yeah, right. Oh, yeah. Um, they, this, this was uh, people, when you climb up to the top of the mountain, the people were almost in shock that you showed up in their presence and stuff, which was, was funny uh, because of the drugs and things. You know, the, uh, these people were living in holes in the ground up there. <laughs> Stop. To have a tourist walk up by them. As well, a, you oh. know, I, I, we would come up there with a whole bunch of rolled up joints in our hands, and you now we show up in the door where they look up and see somebody in an army uniform, and you know who it is. It could be a Sid, you know. <laughs> All right. All right. So it's, on some level, no, no wonder that some of them can remember you from that too. Well, right. So you know, this is the normal life up there. What people are up to, and and uh, you know, we. we Climbed that a bunch of times, and, and um, I filmed off the thing. And we'd bring them, bring them food uh, mm -hmm. from the mess hall. See, and the mess hall, these people were enthusiastic. It says, "Oh, you're going to climb the mountain." Mm -hmm. They had military had what they called a steak. I think it was almost it was probably a pork steak. They looked like like what we, pork steak you'd buy in a market, you know, something like this. And then people were living on sea rations up there, so you bring them some real food and stuff. So we got an old beer case or something to fill in a mess hall where they go into the cooler. These steaks and stuff are are meant for officer food. See? Uh -huh. <laughs> we don't eat these things every day. They do. But so they they give us a box of steaks, we cruise up there, hand them, you know, to, you know, make friends with those guys and and stuff. Um yeah, they were playing the King of the Mountain every night up there. People were trying to come up the right. other side and things. And 
these people in the, um, in the association are in contact with Jim Christopher. This guy is making another video or mm -hmm. DVD about us, what we look like now. And um, John Waltz was left. He was there for three months after I was. As he lives in, in Georgia. I, I, I never met the guy, but he's good on a computer. Mm -hmm. just sent me a wealth of pictures and right. stuff of what things were on, in the later days out there and stuff. And, uh, yeah, this uh, Curtis Greenway, he was with the original um, advance party, and he left a month before I did. But so he was the, well, the only person I ended up in Vietnam that they went there that I was with. I didn't live with him. He was a mechanic and worked on other things. But, um, yeah, so we had to get the... You know, we got computers and iPhone and stuff nowadays, mm -hmm. so we can just call them up and talk to them if you want to, mm -hmm. which is much different than what people had in World War II experience. Sure. And even Vietnam was snail mail compared mm -hmm. to uh, what people got nowadays with modern communications and things. So, um, yeah, that's why you know we got friends, but they're all in different states, and and uh, people are getting older and stuff, and a few people have passed on, mm -hmm. and things. So it's you know something to do. Uh, uh, I just got all these slides and pictures. I I photographed it, and then mm -hmm. uh, when you're t almost 26 years old, your mind is just more developed. Your memories are more clear. I can remember people's names and places as, you know, green places. Who was, uh, you know, I put them out in for the guy. I says, ah, oh, Mr. Enders. Mm -hmm. Oh, I, oh yeah, one officer, one bullet. Remember, yeah, the little guy was 90 pounds or so. Um, and, uh, yeah, so just being there and, and having you know, just a memory, and then uh, this is what just bothered you uh, for a long time. I just missing these people. Some people says, you know, there's something different about you. You ever been in prison? No. 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 <clears throat> Vietnam, possibly, and things. And uh, even in this workplace, people, when they, they, they got problems of their own, so they, for a hobby or something to do, they, they, they want to pick on you and things. And uh, now these people ended up killing themselves. I had three or four people that were my nemesis for a while and things, but their lives were so goofed up to begin with that they ended it putting pistols and shotguns in their mouth or other people. Um, you know, and you come back and I had a a few girlfriends, but every one of them had, and the last one had endometriosis, so they don't have any kids. Mm -hmm. So and people accuse you of being gay, and say, no, and they, you know, you're talking the wrong person, and they made my lifestyle, but they, you are yourself, you're trying to get con me or find out or whatever. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right, but you're, you know, I guess to kind of want to pull things together, just to kind of going to close it out here. I mean, you've had certainly an, an interesting life and, and set of experiences, and you've been able to bring in a lot of details about what the actual Vietnam experience was like from a different perspective than we often get. Uh, so I kind of like to just, just close out here by thanking you for coming in and, and taking the time to oh, share the story yeah. today. Everybody's story is different. You all couldn't be in one place at one time. So mm -hmm. that's what uh, I, I says, look, you know, on these November 11th, Veterans Day, and all these people that are running around with phony veterans, I said, look, just be what you were, and nothing more. Nothing. Just wear, if you got a uniform, wear it. And, the uniform shows you already what year you're in because mm -hmm. the uniforms have changed and things like mm -hmm. this. But, you know, uh, we, we had experienced a lot of phony veterans when they, these Vietnam groups and stuff with people that were in the Navy or 
wearing camouflage and putting themselves in a cage mm -hmm. like they were a POW or something like this. And, and they, you know, it was a cottage industry for quite a while. And people were selling macabre T-shirts with people with chains on their hands. Mm -hmm. said, look, dude, even the POW thing, if you're a, a pilot or something like this, you're one of the king's knights. If, if you kill one of the king's knights, he just may take out a few power plants and sewage plants in your capital cities and stuff and cripple your society, so lay off. I mean, you know, you take, you kill them, we're going to do something, you know, retaliate tenfold. So they, these people live. If you're a minor peon and stuff, this bullet for that AK-47 cost them three dollars and fifty cents a piece. When their year's income is eighty-five dollars, so if they're going to shoot you with that thing, it's about eight or nine days' pay. And they hit you with a rock. So Unfortunately, you didn't have to deal with that kind of thing yourself. Right, but I mean, the lower, lower people were, and especially Vietnamese, were just killed with a shovel or a rock. They didn't waste a bullet on them and stuff. So, um, yeah, and, and uh, you know, you hear that there's stories you don't hear, you know, like 400 or some POWs, but you don't hear too many stories of common people. Mostly they mm -hmm. want to talk about McCain or somebody yeah. like that, you know. Um, no, from what I heard is if it's, if you got see if you're a prisoner, they need caretakers, somebody to take care of you, to feed you, and watch you. And this is a pretty boring job, so they're going to hand you over to somebody. If there is nobody to hand you over to, even the person you hand it over to, it ain't worth their effort to take you up someplace else. So they either just shoot you and junk you out for the clothes you're wearing and the stuff on your body. And, uh, right, but that's really kind of outside of, of what your experience is, and that's kind of what we were focusing on here. Yeah. Um, so, uh, well, yeah, the, uh, just uh, being older and being able to, from coming from a, a, a good place like Grand Rapids, when they put you in the military with all these crude people and stuff, it's easy to excel, uh, especially you have a, a skill or something, you know. Um, it, you know, it's. So the, the military, things were going badly for them. So between Hibbler, they were just trying to retain anybody they wanted. And mm -hmm. uh, occasionally, you know, you're walking around Myers or so and you bump into people who are a veteran. And I, I, I'm only running into one or two people that were my age when they were drafted. And they said, oh, yeah, they, they offered me the world just to re-enlist. Mm -hmm. You know, but they said, look, you know, we're civilians, we got drafted, and we, the military ain't, our, you know, we don't plan on making a career out of it, but they, um, they, well, several people approached me from time to want me to join their unit, which I knew, well, this is not good. I said, look, dude, I got this nice machine shop here, even though it's old and antiquated, and I don't have to pull any maintenance on it here, and life's nice, so I ain't leaving, you know, but they... They, uh, a few people, you know, c come over and try to romance you a little bit for a while, and you just, oh, you know, just meant signing up with them and the just equipment platoon or whatever mm -hmm. they wanted to be head of or something. Uh, uh, no way. And uh, no, the war w was was going kind of badly, more or less, at the end, and we we kind of knew we would. The uh, nobody cared. I was talking about. Colonel Houston, the, the teacher. See, he, this guy made you, he could rattle off every river in the country. Um, we had a history book, and he made it, divided it up into paragraphs. And you had to talk about this paragraph. See, Colonel Houston's room was completely oral recitation, mm -hmm. where you had to stand up there and talk for 15 minutes. The colonel sat back in a chair next to Sue Atlas, this pretty girl, and he would just hold up three fingers, four fingers, you know, zero, mm -hmm. nothing, five for an A, you know, he wouldn't say nothing and stuff. So, uh, yeah, but uh, he'd make us recite the uh, pledge or the, the uh, well, the, the national anthem, the song. This is, uh, you know, the national anthem got four verses. We only sing the first verse. But you had to remember all of them? 
Well, uh, part of in the, the second verse is fight we must because our causes of justice in there. See, and I'm rattling this word by the people back there, the Verics and the LZ, and they're, <laughs> they're laughing at me and looking at me. Well, you kind of an idiot or what? You know, they, nobody cared about this war. They, you're in the military, as you're a prisoner with privileges. You, you, you know, you can't go wherever you want to. These lifers are mean to you any time they are because they, they do it because they can. It's just rag on you for something to do. And, and uh, so, you know, you, you, you do what you want, but nobody was knew this was a lot losing cause. You know, people are saying, sure, I can tell these people I'm from Iowa. I can tell them how to grow rice and advise them. And, you know, <laughs> no, no, these people, you know, politics is local. And, and uh, you know, drugs and these alcoholics and stuff, these civilian contractors and people, that village advisors and stuff. Uh, we lived with Floyd Muir and Orlaz's helper. He was the air compressor mechanic, and, and uh, they had to get out of California for a while. Or, or less a few warrants for their arrests and stuff. So over here, but uh, no Floyd. We had this thing on Floyd with the homosexual. He didn't bother us, but uh, in or less and and uh, but Floyd uh, had this jeep paint battleship gray, which was a neutral. So he's a Vietnamese. Out there's not an army vehicle mm -hmm. or something. And we, he'd let you borrow the thing any time he wasn't using it, take it, borrow his Jeep. So well, things were going pretty safe. We could drive back to the LZ without much protection. And I noticed this little doghouse building. Uh, it had big open windows in it. And the guy is sitting in the thing at a table or something. And I've been buying a couple of times, but, you know, it wouldn't. American, you know, and I thought, well, uh, I cruised by one time. I noticed it's kind of pretty good size in there. You know? so I stopped. Cruise in this little gray building, about 10 foot square or less. You know, he's sitting at a chair. He's sitting down. He's taller than I am. <laughs> you know, <laughs> this guy was seven feet tall, seven foot four or something. I put my hand down. His hand is three times the size of mine. His shoes were 27s, special made. <laughs> he was sitting at a, this table. He had a tumbler of glass, 16 ounce full of whiskey right up to the top, and a bottle of whiskey right next to it to refill it. The alcoholics, I've seen a few of them. The ones that were in Ottawa fireworks were that way. When I talked to them guys, or two of them, they had about 30 of their friends blown to pieces in these displays over mm -hmm. years time. And uh, a girl I met, actually in Sue Morris, no relation, her grandpa lived someplace out where West River Road up the end of this hill and grandma died. And he was the same way, a tumbler, a glass full of whiskey. And, uh, now this guy, you know, he said, he said oh, like, oh, what are you up to? You know, you know I'm a village advisor. <laughs> <You know>? mm. <laughs> They're just sitting there getting drunk and stuff. And, and uh, he's so big, you know. <laughs> I says, yeah, he says, yeah, I, that's why I'm here. I can't do anything. He says, machines, machinery. I, I hit four pedal, two pedals at one mm. time. There's no machine I can run. Heavy equipment I can't run. I can't do anything. Uh, and he's telling me, he says, you know, and, and I was always this way. It was huge right in high school. And he said, these kind of high school, they didn't have any coordination. His mm -hmm. body was so damn big. He, time he told his hand to move his brain. You so know, it's somebody who really shouldn't have been in the Army in the first place. Well, he wasn't in the Army. He was a civilian. Okay, he was a civilian. He, right. he was a village advisor. Okay. That's what he ended up over there, being an alcoholic. and, and uh, yeah, I asked him, he says, you know, you know, what are you doing? He says, well, I'm an advisor to these people and stuff. I usually just sit here and get drunk. And uh, he said, yeah, you know, in high school, I was uncoordinated. People used to mock me and stuff like that. And he says, after 
a year or two out of high school and stuff. He's downtown, and his little town had plate glass windows where you see reflection of yourself in the mirror. And um, a couple of them smart-ass kids are across the street used to call them names, and they come over and yell at him, hey, you idiot, there's something. He went over there on the other side of the street and looked at these dudes and backhanded one of them, knocked him right through a plate glass window, picked the other one up and threw him through a window. <laughs> and since that got him about three and a half years in the penitentiary, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so he ends up out there, you know. The, the Vietnam was full of, this PA&E was full of these alcoholics and rejects. Mm -hmm. We had this character, his real name was Dilly. That was his name. <laughs> this sucker made Charles Bronson look like a boy scout. He was so, he wore complete black and a cowboy hat. <laughs> Sow belly, he was the alcoholics, the alcoholic, you know. It would take sometimes five or six MPs to throw this person into a Connex box when he was drunk. He'd fight them all off at one time. And these Connexes are this eight foot square metal mm -hmm. box with the doors. <laughs> Dilly would get really smashed and drunk and belligerent and stuff. They, you'd start beating people up. They'd call the MPs. You know, MPs would come and they'd have a giant fist fight mm -hmm. and stuff. And they, what was he supposed to be doing there? He's a subcontractor, a civilian, worked for PA&E. But, you know, mechanical stuff or other yeah, things? Yeah, I'm not, not sure what he, what he did, but, the, uh, oh, yeah, see, there, this, this, there were all these goofy civilians. That, you know, I said they, uh, they ran off from the farm to join the circus, and they ran off from the circus to join the war <laughs> <laughs> and follow the war circuit. All right. See, and if they had to skip town, and, and then the... The corruption, see, uh, Mark Elmo, I mean, talk about this character. See, he, uh, Sergeant Patton, I, I got his obituary, he was about 43 years old when we were there. And he was this big black dude, this old rascal, you know, lived downtown and on all this corruption and stuff. And, um, but he favored white people, see, it wasn't as, you know, white people had more brains than some of these black people. A lot of these black people didn't have much education, so they weren't too useful. White people had more brains. They were running the smuggling, you know, this, all this stuff. But uh, see, a lot of people were, you know, pot, other drugs and stuff like this. But they get an R and R for two of them, two weeks out of that year. They go on vacation. But a lot of people weren't leaving. See, this idea of going on vacation with no pot, what? <laughs> you know, vacation. <laughs> so they wouldn't go. So Elmo would take their R&R. &R. Elmo lived in Los Angeles, which, which was an R&R &R center. So he would just go over and ask these people, going to take your R&R? &R? He said, no, I'm just going to take it for you. Sure. He said, OK, well, what do you want back from the world? You know, I'm mean, nice enough. So he would just go in their name. He said, he'd go home. He'd be home for a, a week. He said he ate artichokes every day. You know, stuff slept in his own bed. But then he would go down to these head shops and and buy these zigzag rolling papers. But he would buy the entire box of 100. But he would buy the entire stock in the store. So he'd buy 10 cases or 11, 7 or so packs of 100, you know, zigzags. And, and uh, we're out there in the mountain, you know. and up there in the guard tower and stuff on top of our bunker there. I got pictures of this thing and mm, this three quarter shows up. It's Elmo. Well, he, he just come down from the track. See, we weren't fed yet, so he had to fly on down to see us and stuff. But he's, he, you know, he just come out there, he climb up in the guard tower and hand you a fistful of rolling papers. I've been thinking about you boys. It's the least thing I could do, you know. It's back in L.A. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, all kinds of this stuff was happening. People you knew, you know. El Elmo, literally, when we got there, you get these FNGs, people knew. And, uh, come on, we got to get up, Sergeant Patton. We got to wake him up. We got to go get Sergeant Patton. It's 4.30 in the morning. He's waking you up already. We got to go out there and climb in his truck. Formations at six o'clock. We got to get Sergeant Patton back here by six. He's passed out. 
I, I, he drank a quart of whiskey the night before. He's laying on the front porch of this house in the middle of the train downtown. Mm -hmm. We drive down there and with his three quarter, and there's you gotta have seven of us to lift him up. One under his head, two under here, two here, two on his legs. We shove him into the back of that three quarter. He's unconscious. And he's our cadre. He's up in front. He's supposed to be our mm -hmm. leader and shit. It took three people to hold him up. And this was an everyday occurrence. Elmo would be behind him holding him up backwards. And two of our biggest guys had him under the armpits. And he would be standing up. He'd be standing up for 14 minutes or so. And finally, his eyes would open up. He, his eyes coming online, you know. I mean, this, this, is, this is what was going on in the Trang. People right. like this is our leadership. They're totally incorrupt. Then we had a first sergeant, and he was, this guy was another old black person who just, just call him top, and he was always smoking pot and loaded all the time. Um, so people had, you know, the graph things were happening. This war was an old industry, mm -hmm. so people <laughs> had all kinds of ways of getting around, and and uh, it's who you knew. And, and in my case, being down there in that LZ for a, you know. You know, mountain eleven and a half months. I knew a variety of people from fixing these door hinges. These people sold weed. I, I got a, some pictures out there. This Donald Hendricks, this other little character, a little suitcase with two thousand joints, two hundred packages of ten. He'd have some mamasan roll these things up in the train. This guy, see, no travel orders. You're going to go 180 miles with no orders. How's he going to do this? He's going to hitchhike from LZ to a fire base, from that fire base to another one, to mm -hmm. another point. He don't dare say he wants to go 180 miles unless something's up, but if he's the next one over. And uh, so sometimes it take him a couple of days to get down to the Trang, and then he contracts somebody to roll these things up, and then he come back, and if he's had it cost him a dollar a pack, he was selling it for $2. And, uh, Oh yeah, he's telling me, he says, these, these fire bases are uh, the experience of what this place is like. See, these places get attacked overnight, big time. Now, so when you show up in the daytime, a helicopter lands and a stranger gets off that thing, people run out like it's the farm and stuff. Howdy, cousin, glad mm -hmm. to see you. Come on in. They're just, they got everything. They're going to be real nice to you. And keep you there as long as he can, especially until it gets dark is what they're after. So then you've got to stay there. Right. All right. Okay. Uh, I, we're, hey, we're kind of getting 88 hits directly on where you're in. <laughs> well, we basically pretty much used up our studio time in here today. Oh, okay. But well, you've, done, uh, you've done a really good job of kind of laying in a lot of different kinds of materials. So we're yeah, the, it was who you knew and... and um, being the agent, what I was, respect for age and, and the seniority. I got an Article 15 for, sh for they were test firing these 50 caliber machine guns at these trees. We knew that Vietnamese sat out there and watched us as spies. They couldn't hit the darn things very well. And it's just in the daytime, so I picked up a grenade launcher and fired the first shot and hit directly at that tree right in the middle. It's pretty good luck, and you know, it's like playing golf. So the second shot, a little bit to the right, and the third shot. By the time I fired third shot with this colonel, one of them we kicked out. Mm -hmm. Who was that person? Arrest him. Unauthorized use of material and stuff, you know. So um, I had to cruise up to the orderly room, these other sergeants trying to give me advice before I go in and see this old fart colonel. And uh, I cruise in there into this room. There's these lines on the floor. You know, we can stop, you know, the colonel's sitting at his desk, and he had six people in there. Two standing by the desk, two in the middle, and two behind me to watch, make sure I don't punch him out or something like that, you know. And uh, these people I knew vaguely, but they all knew that Morris was the first SOB out on this mountain. He'd been here longer than anybody. Mm -hmm. And he got this Article 15 from this old asshole and stuff. I had to lean over and sign seven copies. 
of that damn thing. I couldn't say a word to this person mm -hmm. in my defense after you're dismissed. So uh, I walk out of there, and these people that were sort of watching their, me in there, they are outside, and they says, don't worry about it. We already dropped it in the wastebasket. They never check on these things. <laughs> See, and this was partially why Hibbler was after me. All these lifers knew that I was going up there and I was going to lose that five. Mm -hmm. Getting that Article 15. But nothing happened. Nothing happened. And so now that's what made you so suspicious. Who is this somebody? Mm -hmm. You know, he gets a five, he gets more pay for it, he gets, gets to talk to a lot of people and stuff. When things broke down, see, I wasn't talking to a sergeant, some yeah. lieutenant recruits over, whoever was in charge of the operation, the asphalt plant, say, look, we broke the damn thing. I used to make uh, pullers, to, for they had a, several rock crushers. One of them was a cone crusher. And um, this cone would get stuck occasionally, so they'd have to make a puller, pull the thing out, uh, and you screw this thing back, and once they got it pulled out, they'd cut the puller part in half with a cutting torch or something so once the thing was used once so i'd have to make another one and uh but boy once the rock crusher stopped crushing they're over, over there right away being real nice to you and you're talking to these people how oh, can they help us out? oh sure you know you you make them a part and a few hours later and stuff they're all happy and run away with it uh so you know they you just got a rapport with these people and mm -hmm. the other underlings would say look you've talked right. to these guys and, and the, um, the, it was the same thing with the orientals and stuff the people that worked in there they knew what was older by not much <clears throat> these people wouldn't talk to nobody but mm -hmm. I could get a few words out of them and Sergeant Patton he lived with these Vietnamese and, and uh, these hoochmates, these girls, and you could fit five of them on a regular bed. <laughs> we would sleep and stuff together and stuff like this. Uh, when they weren't washing their clothes, they would go <coughs> pass out. <coughs> They're like Mexicans that take a siesta in the middle of the daytime. It's really hot there. <coughs> and uh, Sergeant Patton lived with these people. He's a big black guy, about 40 years old and stuff. And when he talked to them, these Vietnamese women, they were girls from 18 to 20 some years old and stuff. <clears throat> and the uh, English is, you know, they, they knew this language. And uh, when he talked to them, they would, he'd ask them a question, they would answer him back. But they sounded like uh, four-year-old girls. They, they had to choose their words. In English, so it was slower, but well, when, when we tried to talk to them, they'd say nothing, but Sergeant Patton, they, they would open right up to him. But of course, he lived with these people, too, and stuff, and knew to him. But they, uh, other people says, yeah, Orientals do like black people. And so I, I got a couple of black friends, and he says, yeah, he says, oh, Chris, Chris is about, I, I got some friends, I don't have other than, Army guys, I don't have any friends that are my age. I have people I work with, <coughs> I worked with a Brent Kitt, and these guys are about 45, you know. My friends could have been my kids, or that, you know. Uh, that's the way it was in the dye shop and stuff. But, uh, okay. Yeah, we had, uh, uh, this war was old hat, old industry, uh, and there was ways to make money in this thing, a black market. Nobody much cared about the darn thing. And, and uh, people were more or less, if you were in any place that was civilized, you were in it for yourself. Other people lived out in holes in the ground mm -hmm. and stuff like this, had a much different lifestyle. Yes, uh, All right. Okay, uh, and we do need to kind of kind of clo close out here now. So again, just thank you for coming out, sharing the story. Oh, okay.